My name is Stephanie Bauer. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, looking into a truly mysterious missing persons case. On August 19th, 2017, 25-year-old Jenna Van Gelderen suddenly disappeared without a trace. In the two years since her disappearance, her family has worked tirelessly to find out what happened to Jenna, but no arrests have been made. The investigation is cold and now requires new movement. Jenna's brother, mother, and father are desperate for any new information. If you have any details pertaining to Jenna's case, please, we want you to get in touch. Jenna, from the beginning, was one of those children that we had to keep up with. She seemed very precocious. She was very funny. She liked goofing around, and she had a beautiful smile. My daughter was very pretty, a very pretty young woman. She just loved being around family family gatherings. And I can tell you that there is nothing more difficult than a daughter being missing. Jenna still called us mommy and daddy. And I miss having her calling me, mommy. Jenna's disappearance is one of the most complex we've ever worked. It was literally as if Jenna had spoken to her friend, hung up the phone, and vanished off the face of the earth. We've conducted dozens of interviews. We've served dozens of search warrants. We've got cell phone records on a score of people. And we don't have anything definitive to show for it this time. To understand the facts related to Jenna's disappearance, I'm meeting Captain Ford, who is leading the investigation. What happened before Jenna disappeared? Well, Jenna was actually house-sitting for her parents who were uh, out of the country on vacation. About 10.30 on August 18th, 2017, we know she leaves the house to go and meet a friend. We know that she's back at the house at 1.15 because she calls a friend and they have a, a phone conversation. At 2.15, she sends a text message to the same friend telling her that she's going to bed for the evening. After that, we have no um, outgoing activity from Jenna. There was supposed to be a veterinarian coming on the 19th to actually make a house call for a sick cat. So when the veterinarian arrived and couldn't get anybody to the door, he called the brother. The brother, Will, responded to the location. Jenna wasn't there, and then reported her missing on the 20th. Jenna had just recently moved out on her own. What do you know about her life away from her parents and out from under their roof? Jenna did have a roommate in an apartment, but she did not stay there every night. The anecdotal evidence we have is that she stayed with friends, she'd stay with her parents. Are there any suspects right now? There are people that we consider suspects, yes. The family uh, and the community has come together and has put a $50,000 reward out there for information leading to us finding Jenna. And from that $50,000 reward, we've got no tips whatsoever. The effect on Roseanne and I has been very dramatic. At first, we were blaming each other. There's the nonstop, what if I had done this? What if I had done that? There's absolutely no way Jenna would have left voluntarily without contacting us. Jenna had recently been diagnosed with autism and relied heavily on her routines. To learn more, I'm visiting her parents, Leon and Roseanne. Hi, Leon. Hello. I'm Stephanie. How nice you to doing? meet you. Thank you for having me in. When you and your wife came back into town and Jenna had been house sitting for you, she was here in the living room and sh everything should have been just fine, except that there were a few things that you noticed that were uncharacteristic. Is, is that right? Yeah. All right, show me, what did you think looked out of order? Was anything missing? What did you notice right when you got home? Well, Jenna's everyday shoes are here on the floor. If she had left voluntarily, she would have definitely taken those shoes with her. This green phone cord was her phone cord for her phone. 
And then on the wall over here, there was at that time a frame that had a tapestry in it, and the glass was broken, and the tapestry was missing. Were there any other signs of living here? Jenna was taking care of the cat, and the cat hadn't been fed. The cat hadn't been fed, and her personal items, I mean, a cell phone charger, that's important to keep with you if you're going somewhere, right. and your shoes that you wear every day, all that stands out. One of the uh, odd things Jenna did was she would carry around her toiletries in a plastic bag. If somebody was a stranger, they would just think that's a bag of garbage. But we right away realized that was Jenna's everyday toiletries, and she wouldn't have left without that. Let's take a look really quick here at this bathroom bag. And so it was found right here? Yes. Everything in there is exactly the way we found it. Deodorant, makeup, just everyday toiletry items. I say every time the house was staged because of the room Jenna was staying in, she had a suitcase in there and the suitcase was gone to make it look like she had taken off. When Jenna was in elementary school, we noticed the social difficulties. She often got left out of birthday parties and fun things that kids go to. And she was tested with having something that they called at that time a nonverbal learning disability. In 2016, Jenna found out that she was on the autism spectrum. So tell us, what are your fondest memories of Jenna? When she was little, she was, you know, very cute. She also was very challenging because we learned at an early age that she had a learning disability. And she displayed that more in a way of questions, question after question after question. How does that leave her with her newer friends as a young woman? I would say she was extremely gullible, extremely vulnerable, because she, she wanted the friendship so badly, and she couldn't always tell when their intentions maybe were not to be a good friend. What do you think happened? I don't know. The only thing I do know is her sole purpose of staying at the house was to take care of our 21-year-old cat that she adored. She would never have left without making sure that the vet tech that was giving her medicine knew, and she, she would have never done that. Sometimes before I go to sleep, I'll look outside like, is, is she gonna be there? I keep my cell phone every night next to the bed, just hoping that she'll call. And it's been two years. It's, um, it's, it's just the not knowing is the worst. Keen to know more about the impact of Jenna's autism, I've arranged to speak with a childhood friend, Becca, who lives in Charleston, South Carolina. What was Jenna like as a person? She was always kind of like a quirky, quirky girl. She always asked questions. She was a questioner. Mm -hmm. And that was a part of her disability is she always needed clarification of things. How do you think her autism affected her social life? She didn't have a lot of friends growing up, and a lot of people were not patient with her. It became like a bullying thing. People were annoyed by it, or Jenna's annoying because she asked questions. She was desperate to have friendships and to be liked and eager to please and to make someone happy. And so I think that she did let people take advantage of her because in her mind that was better than not having friends at all. I'm so curious about the time that she moved out and is wanting this newfound independence and she's breaking away from her parents, but she's also dealing with autism. I found out that she was living somewhere new, but then my mom had told me that she 
wasn't disclosing where she was, and that made me really worried. Do you think she was specifically trying to hide from her parents where she was living? She always interpreted her parents worrying as, my parents don't like these people because they're this, 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 and this. So I think she hid a lot of things because she was scared of them not approving. She said, I'm just trying to kind of be private right now. And, and that kind of worried me, but I didn't, I didn't think too far into it. Her social life was a total mystery most of the time. About six months before Jenna disappeared, she was beginning to hang out with people that were not looking out for Jenna's best interests. Jenna had her one and only full-time job working at a pet supply store for about three years. We found out from people that Jenna worked with that certain men were coercing her to steal money at work to give them money. Jenna, when confronted at work, signed a statement saying she had stolen $3,000. I started investigating people that were showing up on her phone log. And as a result, my relationship with Jenna had degenerated because I was confronting her with who these people were and what their um, backgrounds were. After hearing how Jenna became secretive in the months before she vanished, I want to ask Leon about anything else he's learned since she disappeared. You had access to her phone records because she was on your cell phone plan? Yes. The cell phone that Jenna had, was that her only cell phone? No. Unknown to me, she had a second phone and uh, she actually told friends that she had that phone because her father was monitoring her calls. Okay, okay. Have you been able to get the records for that one? Yes. We got the records on all her Google chats, telephone logs, Facebook chats, because she would share her passwords with my son. So what did you find? Someone was pressuring Jenna, according to her Google chats, to be at the apartment that night. Do you know who that person is? Can you tell by the Google no. chat? So it seems that someone was wanting her to leave here and go back to her apartment, and they were putting the pressure on for her to get back there. What was the last correspondence on that second cell phone? Well, the second cell phone does not record information whatsoever about text messages. And there were a lot of text messages coming in, but it doesn't say from who. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't discern that. While no conclusive evidence could be taken from Jenna's cell, two weeks after her disappearance, there was a potential break in the case. The one thing that made Jenna's case difficult was that her phones were gone and her car was gone. And we knew that once the car was found, we would have a better idea what had occurred. Her car was actually located on September 5th on DeFore Place in Atlanta. The initial report that the car had been found kind of filled us with elation. The seat was pushed back. Jenna was a very small stature person, so we don't think she put the car there. But as we moved through the car and there was simply no evidence inside of it, the elation kind of turned to a, a lot of disappointment. Although Jenna's car didn't provide any conclusive DNA evidence, Captain Ford is taking me to a location that may have significance. Jenna's second phone last pinged in Fairburn, Georgia. It's heavily wooded in places, overgrown in places. If I was going to dump a body, it's precisely the location I would pick. So Captain Ford, this is Fairburn, where Jenna's phone last pinged? Correct. Her second phone or the primary phone? This is her second phone. So this is kind of the secret cell phone, we'll Correct. call it. 
If the battery dies on the phone, will it stop pinging? Yes. And, and the tricky thing about phone pings is that you only get a ping when there's data going back and forth on the phone. We just got lucky in that somebody tried to call that phone that early in the morning. The area that her phone last ping covers several hundred acres in this area. Several hundred acres. So you, it sounds great. Oh, someone's phone pinged, you know the spot, but really you're talking a big- A big area. Area of land. Correct. You'd be hard pressed to find a more secluded area next to a major highway. This little dirt road is easy to miss if you don't know it's here. Has anything ever been found out here before? Uh, anecdotally, we were told by the uh, Fairburn Police Department that they have found uh, a body here before. Do you have any evidence to say that Jenna was out here with her phone? We've gone through this area extensively. But when you start talking about hundreds of acres and it's this much underbrush, it would be very easy to miss something. And her car was picked up on a license plate reader camera in the city of Atlanta at about the same time that her phone pinged here. We're very confident that the car and the phone were not in the same place. And how far of a distance is that? About 30 miles. And now the question is, was Jenna with her car in Atlanta where the license tag was picked up? Was she here with her phone where it pinged or was she neither? Correct. With a lack of solid evidence, any sightings on DeFore Place where the car was abandoned or around Fairburn might prove crucial to Jenna's case. If you were in Fairburn on the morning of the 19th or you saw the car parked on DeFore Place, we'd be very interested in hearing anything that you might have seen, anyone you might have seen around the car, any suspicious activity in Fairburn, any small detail could help us. As her mother, the fact that I can't do anything to find her is, is the worst feeling in the world. I would like to say to people, anyone who knows what happened to Jenna, please come forward. We need to have some type of closure. Jenna seems to have simply vanished. Did you see Jenna near or at one of these two locations on the morning of Saturday, August 19th? Do you know why Jenna had a second cell phone? If you have any new theories or clues about this case, please get in touch. You can continue to follow the story at oxygen.com and we'll continue to release new information as we're able and as new leads come to light.